What's up, guys? This is Werner speaking to you from the wild, wild west right here to talk about the <laughs> Unholy Alliance, sort of, and also just sort of the new growing trend of hip-hop merging with country western, and then specifically I'm going to talk about the original. But before I get to that, I just want to talk, set the scene sort of of what's going on, uh, because a lot of hip-hop heads have probably been logically <laughs> avoiding any sort of connection hip-hop has with country music. Uh, and it's interesting that it's actually sort of really becoming a thing and sort of even sort of a legitimate thing. I mean, there's always sort of been tangential connections between hip-hop and uh, country western. I mean, certainly like, you know, Malcolm McLaren, Buffalo Gals, and even some of his other songs. Similarly, you know, sort of had fun with mixing, you know, crazy, you know, outside hip-hop genres into hip-hop. And, you know, so, of course, talking about square dancing and country western stuff, and, you know, that was sort of a jokey kind of thing. Or, you know, something sort of like this, where it's a, a legitimate country band, Country Rap, here, you notice is the title of the album, and they have a song on here called Country Rap, where they rap, but it's basically a straight-up country song. Which just, or if you ever want to sort of think about the distinction between hip-hop and rap, you know, sort of as KRS would say, want something to do, want something to live, and all that, but do you really want... To you know, a prime example of the distinction, that's it. Because they're legitimately rapping, but it's definitely not hip-hop. So that's really sort of a strong distinction if you ever want to see that. And obviously, there's plenty of ways to distinguish that. There's hip-hop music that has no rapping, etc., etc., but that's a great illustration. Uh, or something like this, Wild Willie Barrett is even called Rapping on a Mountain. And it's sort of, you know, I mean, it's definitely not hip-hop, and it's only vaguely what you might consider rapping, sort of a really kind of fast talk style, and certainly there have been plenty of examples in all musical genres of sort of rapping that isn't in hip-hop music, from The Last Poets to, you know, anything like Shakespeare minstrels. And then, you know, kind of classically, hip-hop is sort of played with the imagery of Wild Wild West kind of stuff. I mean, this being the most obvious example right there, Kumo D, Wild Wild West. Uh, certainly you can kind of think of something like Sidat X, you know, the whole Wild Cowboys image and stuff like that of his uh, first solo album. And there's been, you know, plenty of music videos like Marlon Marl the Symphony was set in a Wild West saloon. You know, uh, Luan Love had a Wild West song where he's, you know, again, the song, nothing to do with Wild West or country or anything, but he's rapping in a country music, you know, in a country stage, a setting, probably a back lot to some studio. Uh, and even when they do sort of rap maybe about cowboys or something, though, that's different from really connecting to country music. Country music and just sort of westerns and the western motif of western films and cowboys are two sort of different things. You know, in the later 80s, you had, like, the KMC crew doing a remake of that Charlie Daniels song. But again, they really just sort of took the themes. And actually, they do have, like, fiddles and stuff like that in instrumental. So they do kind of really at least play with that, you know, legitimately. They did, you know, the devil comes down to Georgia as opposed to the... Well, they did The Devil Comes Up to Michigan as opposed to The Devil Goes Down to Georgia. And, of course, then there's stuff like the group Down South, where they would rap about from being from Down South, but musically, no connection to country at all. You know, I mean, it's just more the novelty that they're from the South. But if you think about it, so what? Lots of rappers are from Florida and from Texas. I mean, the Ghetto Boys are from Texas. But I definitely wouldn't say there's any country rap connection beyond that. But now we're looking at what actually really does connect them. And you can think of sort of Chubb Rock doing his, you know, Swing Your Partner song, which is really just sort of an update of Buffalo Gals. And plenty of people have actually done updates of Buffalo Gals, you know, even like Thurston Howell and stuff like that and sort of been playing with, just because that's sort of an iconic song. But again, they're not really trying to connect the country. Um, and then you think of stuff like, you know, Mike D from the Beastie Boys did a country album, and that's at least a legit country album. That's now in the 90s, and you really start to see, I mean, it's sort of a joke, it's sort of a parody, it's sort of just a silly experiment, but at least he's sort of doing country music. Even much more recently, though, it's really becoming a thing. I mean, you think of, like, Bubba Sparks. He's got his country song with, like, a country band, I think. It's called, like, Country Folks. That's even the title. And it's definitely country-style music. You think of Nelly doing songs like, you know, that Cruise remix, uh, which, I mean, even that. The original version of Cruise is by a country band, and then the remix features Nelly, which is really just like the old school days when you sort of thought about hip hop merging with R and B and stuff like that. And they would make this sort of tenuous, you know, is this okay to sort of do a guest spot collaboration, you know? And you'd sort of see on like video music box, like, ooh, an R and B singer with a guest rapper. That's almost sort of what country is doing now. They're just sort of tenuously testing those waters, you know. I mean, Snoop Dogg's doing a song with Willie Nelson now. Um, you know, trying to think. L. Cool J, of course, did his awful accent on racist song. Tim McGraw also did a song with Nelly. Um, B.O.B. did a song with Taylor Swift. I mean, you could say Taylor Swift is maybe a little bit 
so pop that she's barely country anymore, but she's definitely still, you know, but I mean, so there's just plenty of examples of us becoming a real and real thing. But before all of that, there was a group, actually one of my favorite super old school groups, uh, definitely sort of an overlooked group, a group that never, that had a lot of talent, talented MCs, talented songwriting. Again, maybe you don't necessarily think of them as the most strongest MCs compared to someone like, you know, Kaz, Cool Diddy, Melly Mel, you know, from that era, but definitely some strong MCs and more just strong record making period. I mean, these were a group that had the music, that had the style, that had the production, that had it all wrapped up together in a really strong way. I'm talking about the Disco 4, and I think, honestly, they basically disappeared mostly because of their name. I think calling themselves Disco by the mid-80s was just so... You know, they were never going to catch on in a big way. But they were a really talented group, did a lot of good stuff. You know, they had a lot of singles on profile. And I just brought up a couple of them here. You know, just boom, we're at the party. And before they were on profile, you know, later on they were on reality records. That's that one. Uh, and before that, they were on Enjoy Records. Uh, you know, Bobby Robinson, which is the same label as like the Treacherous Three and stuff like that. In fact, one of the Disco Four's father is Bobby Robinson, which is probably a large <laughs> reason why how they got signed to them. But this is the record I really wanted to talk about. Blam, Enjoy Records, the Disco Four, 1982. Really the first, I would say, legitimate connection between hip hop and country. Now, admittedly, it is sort of more of a playful thing. You know, um, I mean, almost you kind of think of sort of like the Johnson crew doing Space Cowboy or something. It's not like that, though, because, I mean, it is legitimate connections musically. They're talking about not just cowboy and Western stuff, but actual, like, country-Western music kind of stuff. Uh, and while at first name the instrumental sounds too jokey, and, you know, some of their courses are going, like, say, yee-haw, yippee-ki-yay, and stuff like that, you say, well, this is just too jokey. This is like a rap and dupe. This isn't, like, a real connection between the two genres. But actually, really, musically especially, it is. One thing let's note here is that it's credited to Musical accompaniment, Pumpkin and Friends. Now, Pumpkin, of course, is a great classic, one of the earliest hip-hop producers who was really just known for his musicality, for his drumming, and being able to play all kinds of instruments. In fact, at Disco 4, one of the other things they did in their career, they were part of the uh, Pumpkin Profile All-Stars, which featured a whole bunch of groups like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, and I think the Fresh Free MCs maybe, just, you know, I guess largely the All-Stars that were on Profile Records, all sort of following, you know, Pumpkin's lead to just a great, one of the early examples of a great posse cut. Uh, and Disco 4 were a key part of that. I mean, I think they actually had a large part of writing the bulk of that song as well. And if you just think about it, they had a kind of a cool kind of underground history, like that famous uh, Profile Christmas album, which of course featured Run DMC's Christmas and Hollis, as well as plenty of other great Christmas raps by other artists like Sweet G, Dana Dane, King's Son. They are on there, they had a song on there, they just had a lot of dope stuff. So anyway, that's a connection with Pumpkin, uh, and so he's doing, as it says here, the musical accompaniment. But what's interesting now is the instrumental they use, again, is country rock rap. This is their country western song, and it's definitely a country-themed instrumental. But what's fun about it is, and I mean, it's got like, you know, banjos again. It's really, you could say it takes it too far almost into parody. Except the instrumental they use is this guy, Bad Basco, is this legit country bluegrass kind of group. Um, and the song is actually, the part of that song is actually on the original Ultimate Breaks and Beats series. It's one of the original breaks on there. Uh, but these were the first guys to actually use it on a hip hop record. Uh, and what's even more interesting is because they have a hard time using that break to really make it come alive for their song, they actually got the original banjo singer from the original country record to come into the, you know, the studio in New York and to play live banjo on this record. So they're not just using the break. Again, 1982, this is really before the days of sampling. It's when they were all recreate the music. You know, you think of Sugar Hill Gang, you know, they didn't sample Cool in the Gang. They had the Sugar Hill Band, a, a Fast Comet, you know, replay the music. And that's basically what they do here, except in this case, they even go, you know, above and beyond by getting, again, the original banjo player to come onto their studio session. And so it's really like a legit, as you're ever going to get, country-western collaboration with hip-hop. And it's a good record. Again, maybe it's somewhat silly, but Disco 4 was all about fun party records. So being a bit silly isn't, you know, doesn't illegitimize their style or their records. And it's just a cool break. In fact, it's actually been used since. Special Ed used it on a song called Hoedown. And you might say, oh, well, maybe that's sort of a country-western collaboration too, but it's really not, uh, because he's basically just using the term hoedown as a uh, pun. And if you listen to the song, you know what that's about. But uh, he amps the humorous connection of the pun by using that original kind of country break. So, of course, I'm going to play a clip of this right now, but I just wanted to, A, kind of show you that, you know, hip-hop and country collaboration doesn't necessarily have to be awful. Of course, 
most of the time it probably is, and certainly we don't want more accidental racists. But, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be so terrible. I mean, if you think of Buck 65's Talking Hunky Blues, I think that's his strongest album. It has some of, you know, consistently, he certainly had probably better songs on some of his other albums. But all the way through, I think it's his strongest album, and definitely some really solid material there, no matter how you cut it. Uh, if you look, like, I'm not a fan of guys of, like, Nelly and Bubba Sparks and those guys, but certainly, if you're going to listen to the song by Bubba Sparks, actually something like uh, Country Folks is probably one of his best songs. Uh, it's one of the songs where it really makes me think, oh, okay, I get his appeal, you know, I'm not a fan of his, I'm not buying his albums, but I'm like, okay, that I can kind of get behind more than some of the other stuff. So, I mean, at least the very notion isn't completely poisonous. It's not an immediate sign to, like, plug up your ears and run away. There's a chance it could be dope. Uh, and also now, just to say that this isn't a new concept at all, to really take it back, you know, a lot of people getting into this, oh, you know, here's a new thing, the hick hop is what they call it, you know, hick, country hicks, hip hop, you know, so hick hop is a big thing. And if you think about it, like, I think like psychopathic records there's really no reason why some kind of hip hop band wouldn't be perfect to be their next group to sign to you know their juggalo thing and again i'm not really a fan of that either but it's a legit hugely popular movement and i could totally see it all coming together you know this could really be the next big thing in the next year or two uh so it's fun to see that actually though there's a lot of legit history behind it uh and it goes all the way back a lot further back than i think critics today who talk about hip hop realize all the way back to 1982 with the Disco 4. One of the most underrated, just one more example of the way they were ahead of their time. So probably, I guess I'll call it the first hip hop record. Country rock rap, Disco 4. Great record. Instrumental on the B-side. Back in the days, that was kind of all you would have, vocal version, instrumental. So here's a clip of it now, and thanks for watching. Peace out, and uh, you be Kaye or something. <laughs> all right. Yes, 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 And Johnny Cash. Yeah, yeah. Mo Cash! <laughs> hey, listen to our soundtrack. Listen. <laughs> My name Lee on this is Lester. Lester. We got a new style we country western. western. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look at the clothes. Look at the clothes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we gonna be big. I'm telling you. Oh, we